started just in the interest of time with the zoom meetings we've got uh 40 minutes um this sort of the way they set these things up it should be more than enough time to go through the presentation which covers uh some of the tours i'm leading this uh winter um all things uh positive and uh just quickly about me bruce knows me i worked with him at the uh, province of ontario uh where i retired um uh about uh, uh back in june after 32 years oh hi sean just starting up right now um so uh in the past i've been to cuba many times uh leading tours uh doing tours and uh, just spending time in cuba and uh today i just want to go over two of the tours that uh that are planned for january and february this year uh the presentation itself is just a slide presentation of some photos primarily uh, it takes about 30 minutes to get through, and that way we should have about 10 minutes to um, to chat at the end. And uh, with the Zoom meetings, I'm told that um, that possibly if we run out of time, the trick is uh, just log off the meeting and then log back on, and we should be able to pick up where we left off. Okay, so with that, if I can just move to the next slide. There we are, a bit of a delay with the computer. Uh, so just to introduce uh, the company, Bicycle Breeze. Bicycle Breeze is actually the tour company that operates the bike tours in Cuba. Uh, they've done it for 20 years. My role is, uh, is to help uh, promote the tours and uh, give people the opportunity to come down to Cuba and join us on our adventures. Um, the company itself is, is uh, owned by Peter Marshall, who uh, hails from the UK. He lived in... Uh, St. Catharines for most of his life and has been in Cuba for, for most of the last 20 years. Uh, he's married to Anna, who is his uh, Cuban wife, and between the two of them, they manage this company. Um, based on that, they just have a tremendous experience of cycling in Cuba. Uh, they know the island really well. They know how to work with the Cuban government, which is at times a bit challenging. Um, and they've, as I say, been running tours for 20 years, so they can make things happen where other people wouldn't be able to. Uh, all of the tours are fully supported. These are not um, unsupported tours or partially supported. Um, an air-conditioned uh, luxury tour bus follows along with the cyclists through the entire ride, um, stays behind the, the, the last rider, so nobody gets left behind and uh, everyone's supported. A Cuban culture guide, uh, which is a Cuban government employee, uh, is part of the team and he or she provides us with uh, information every day on where we're going, um, the history of it, uh, the history of Cuba, uh, the local geography, etc. Um, the tour leader would be me, uh, the bike mechanic is Yuani, and he makes sure that our bikes are operating properly all the time and of course we have a bus driver. The tour price includes all accommodation and most meals. We say most meals because uh, during the daytime, if we're out at lunch, uh, there's often not a chance to, you never really know what we'll do for lunch. Sometimes it's a box lunch. Sometimes we uh, take food ourselves. And sometimes we'll stop at a restaurant and get something to eat. And Bicycle Bees, Breeze does provide um, bicycle rentals uh, at a fee. One of the things that uh, attracted me to Bicycle Breeze, um, who I've been riding with since 2010, is that they support local Cuban youth. So they've established a network with uh, coaches for Cuban youth teams. Uh, virtually every province in Cuba has a, has a youth cycling team. And as you may know, uh, Cuba doesn't really have bicycle stores. And in fact, all of their bicycles and racing bicycles and equipment, um, well, almost all, perhaps nearly all, have been donated by uh, tourists. And Peter and Bicycle Breeze have helped coordinate this for many years. And part of the, the tours, we encourage uh, clients to bring equipment to donate, um, particularly things like newer used tires. Um, we're looking for racing tires. So the 700 by 23 to 25 millimeter tires are perfect but anything is appreciated the photo in the background there is peter uh back when we were presenting some bicycle equipment to uh, these young ladies who are part of the Las tunas cycling club i'll just quickly click on this link which hopefully will play it's a video of us cycling in cuba 
let's spend a few minutes enjoying some views of cycling the roads of Cuba from behind the handlebars. Often the biggest traffic you'll come across is a horse-drawn cart. Just make sure you take the time to pull over to the left and pass it smoothly and quietly. Here we are coming out of a small village in southern Cuba, just heading in towards the mountains and once again passing, um, in this case, a cart of sugar cane being pulled by oxen on a quiet and quite smooth side road in Cuba. This is a tour around the city square in Pilon, Cuba. There's a church in the background and here we're passing the local uh, inter-provincial bus station. This is where uh, Cubans would take a bus to travel to Santiago or Bayamo and uh, beyond. They might also be visiting relatives nearby. As you can see, there's very few cars on the road. People get around on bicycles, by horses, by horse-drawn carts. Um, and they walk and make their way around the countryside in a very relaxed and calm and measured manner. This is one of the reasons that traveling in southern Cuba is so peaceful. There's a horse-drawn cart, which is actually a taxi, which would run a consistent route around the town of Pilon, taking people from work and to their home. And here we are heading on a, quite a rough stretch of road. This is quite a rare stretch of road in terms of how rough it is. Um, it's part of the South Coast Road. A moment ago we were passing sheep and goats on the side of the road. And a little beyond there we come to a part of the South Coast Road where the ocean is on the right and the mountains are on the left. The road has been damaged by hurricanes over the years and is quite washed out, but nonetheless, despite some potholes and cracks, it's very easy to ride on. Um, here my wife Beth is catching up to some uh, cattle that are grazing along the side of the road. This is very common. They're very used to bicycles and other, other forms of transportation. It's very easy to pass them. Just go slow, take your time and uh, make your way by them and uh, they won't bother you and you won't bother them. But what a spectacular piece of road this is and there's so many beautiful roads like this in Cuba. So uh, the Celia Sanchez tour is uh, running from January 8th to 22nd uh, this winter. Um, I'm pretty confident that the rides will go ahead. We've uh, got two tours scheduled in November and December that are already a go and uh, we're getting some very good signals from uh, the Cuban government in terms of uh, how they plan to manage tourism this coming year. The Celia Sanchez tour is, is known as the Celia Sanchez tribute ride. It celebrates the life and times of Celia Sanchez who's known as the heroine of the revolution. She uh, was born in uh, Media Luna and uh, had some education in Manzanillo before uh, moving to Pilon with her father, uh, where she lived um, as the revolution was taking form. And uh, she supported Fidel and the troops uh, throughout, uh, ahead of the war and throughout it. Um, so the route uh, covers the area where, where she grew up, beginning in Holguin, uh, heading down to Bayamo, um, through the second largest city in the country, Santiago. Uh, then we then move along that South Coast Road and uh, through her, um, the area she grew up in. Um, we head into the mountains. There's a little uh, side route there where we head into San Santo Domingo where we visit La, La Comandancia de la Plata where Fidel hid in the mountains for a few years. Um, during the revolution, uh, masterminding and, and planning the, the, the war, um, we go to Las Tunas and then end in Guadalavaca. So um, again, just on the road, the tour bus follows us all the way. Um, riders, uh, we provide water, which uh, we can use to fill your water bottle every few hours during the ride so that you don't run out of water. And uh, we encourage people to bring snacks uh, from home in Canada or America or where you're traveling from. Uh, things like that are, are fairly rare in Cuba. And uh, it's a great idea to have some of them on the bus for snacks as we go. 
Um, as we begin the Celia Sanchez route, we head to the El Sultan, which is a small uh, hotel in the mountains. Um, we just are going to the low end of the mountains at this point. Uh, while we're there, we do a walking tour of the mountains and um, the, the mountains are known for growing fruit and coffee. This is a picture of a, of a woman called Maria. She um, roasts coffee on a plantation in that area. At the back of the picture is her roasting pan where she uh, pan roasts the beans. And then she's doing a pour over coffee technique there, which is uh, the common Cuban way of making coffee in the countryside, um, a cotton sock filled with beans. They pour the boiling water into the cup below and then repeat that process, pouring it through uh, the filter a few times to make a really strong brew. This is uh, the Moncada Barracks in Santiago de Cuba, which we'll visit. Um, there's bullet holes in the wall there. That is a symbol of Fidel's first attempt at a revolution in Santiago in 1953, where he stormed the Moncada Barracks in an unsuccessful uh, assault. He was captured. Most of the uh, combatants were killed. Um, he was put in jail for three years and released eventually. Uh, he went back to Mexico where he then plotted the second um, assault and the successful revolution. While we were at the barracks, uh, this picture I think was in 2015, there was a uh, school group there being entertained by a local band. It was fun to watch. Santiago is known as the, as, the, as the center of Cuban revolutionary history. That's a, a huge statue that we'll visit of uh, General um, uh, Antonio Maceo. After we leave Santiago, we head down that South Coast Road. Um, this is a, a fairly freshly paved part of the road. It's uh, beautiful to ride. Uh, typical Cuban traffic jam with a cart with a uh, horse pulling it. You'll note on the shoulder of the road, a well-worn path. That's where the horses, the horse riders uh, ride alongside the road. Um, and that's pretty typical of traffic in the area. We spend some time on the beach, which uh, I have to admit is one of my favorite parts. As we carry on down that South Coast Road, um, the bus can't follow us for about a uh, 150 kilometer portion. So we have Jeeps that follow us um, so that you're supported the entire time. And uh, there's just a picture of uh, my wife being uh, helped by Celso, one of the tour guides. As we carry on down that South Coast Road, I, I love to take pictures of it. It's uh, just a beautiful piece of scenery. We're heading here in towards Maria del Portillo. Uh, my wife and I have spent many months living in that area and uh, riding up and down this beautiful road. This is the home of Celia Sanchez's father, Dr. Sanchez. Uh, it's in Pilon. We can visit it. It's a museum. Um, at the museum, uh, Celia worked alongside her father, who um, was a doctor and a dentist supporting the poor uh, workers in the uh, Pilon area. We move on to uh, Playa Las Coloradas, where the boat, the grandma, um, uh, came ashore. Um, uh, it was 82 uh, revolutionaries on the boat. Most of them were killed or captured um, as the boat came aground, but Fidel and um, a number of other uh, men carried on to, to begin the revolution. And they were supported by Celia um, in terms of uh, assessing the landing sites and uh, getting them up into the mountains where they began uh, their revolution. Uh, this is up at Comandancia de la Plata where, uh, where Fidel did hide out. Celia did join him at a point uh, for the last year or two there. And uh, we can walk right into the mountains, uh, way up around uh, 1,200 meters uh, and visit the camp. This is just a picture of uh, the Paladars, which are private restaurants that we try to find to eat lunches and dinners at whenever possible. Um, this is where you get authentic Cuban food and music and uh, really enjoy uh, the Cuban experience. This is my wife and I in Manzanillo, so we're just heading north. Um, there's a poster there of uh, Celia 
just celebrating her importance and the poster makes reference to her experience and knowledge of the Manzanillo area and how important she was to support Fidel in the war. Uh, as we move north, we come into Las Tunas, uh, the Las Tunas Cycling Club. Um, the youth club comes out to meet us and rides together with us into Las Tunas. And of course, there again is the bus that follows us. We have a barbecue dinner at the home of the coach in Las Tunas. And um, traditionally, they uh, barbecue a pig. And finally, we stay in Guadalavaca at an all-inclusive resort for um, two nights, uh, gives us a chance to pack our bikes, decompress, and get ready for the return home. The second tour um, is the Fat Mary tour, and it follows a week later after the Celia tour ends. Uh, so now we're at the other side, the west end of Cuba, and in this, uh, for this tour we fly into Veradero Airport, and we begin uh, at that green hour in Matanzas, we head uh, over to Havana along the coast road, the northern road there, and spend a day or two in Havana before carrying on through um, the mountain range, the Sierra Rosario and Sierra de los Oraganos um, Mountains, finally ending at uh, Maria La Gorda at the far west tip. We have a tailwind for this route because traditionally, and quite different than North America, the, the wind is generally from the east uh, heading west, so this route's also known as the tailwind tour. Um, we take uh, the, the bus back to Veradero, um, avoiding having a headwind all the way back there, so about 10 days, uh, 15 days of riding across to the western tip of Cuba. One of the first places we stop is the Bellamar Caves in Matanzas, which is uh, beautiful uh, caves to visit. Um, this bus follows us again along that Via Blanca, which uh, takes us into Havana. Um, when we get to Havana, before we actually enter the city, we stop at the Havana Velodrome and again meet a youth cycling club that rides at the Velodrome. Um, and I think we should get a chance to ride on the Velodrome ourselves if we so choose. In Havana, there's uh, so many things to do. One of the things we'll do is a vintage car ride uh, along the Malacan, the road that's on the, on the uh, seaside at Havana. We'll uh, have a walking tour of old Havana. And as we leave Havana after that, uh, that day spent touring the, the city, um, we will stop at Punta Brava, which is a, um, a relatively poor part of Havana on the west side and meet the Punta Brava Youth Cycling Club. Again, um, opportunity to leave some donations for the youth and see their cycling club, which again, Peter and Bicycle Breeze um, have helped build their, their clubhouse and support the club frequently. As we, as we head further west, we go through Mill Cumbras, and um, those of you who are familiar with camping at cottages in Northern Ontario, you'll, uh, recognize a similar experience uh, camping at a, in wooden cottages uh, in the mountains. We frequently stop, um, just to, I like this photo, just to show stopping on the side of the road. Um, we like to take chances to take pictures, to refresh our water, um, and uh, to, get, to get out of the sun occasionally in the shade of a tree. We have a beach day at Cayo La Vitsa, um, and again the beautiful beaches. One of my favorite things to do is eat lunch on the beach. We cycle through the Vanalis Valley and um, the mountains here are um, representative of a karst geography. So it's a limestone that's eroded away and left these, um, these low mountains in the background. Uh, it's a spectacular area and, um, and uh, a worldwide biosphere of, uh, of high significance. We have uh, dinner at an eco farm in Vanalis. So this is a um, farm to fork uh, uh, restaurant. You can see in the background where they're growing the vegetables and the crops for the meals. Um, have an outdoor dinner and in the background is the, uh, is the uh, Vanalis Valley and the mountains. We'll do a walking tour in the valley. And uh, further along we stay at uh, 
uh, Los Jamines Hotel uh, in the Oregonos Mountains. Again, a spectacular hotel. These are not the typical hotels you see in tourist brochures for beach resorts. Um, this is away from a beach and, uh, and a, a truly unique, uh, proper cultural Cuban experience. This is a picture of us with Daciel, the bus driver that we had in uh, our Mango 2020 tour. And um, Daciel and the team would stop and buy fruit um, on the side of the road when it was available. We all pooled together a few dollars to support to, to buy the fruit. And uh, Daciel would bring it out and, and uh, we'd have these wonderful fruit snacks on the side of the road during our bike rides. We spend another day um, at a beach, in this case, in this case, Cayo Judias, um, another spectacular beach on the north shore of Cuba. As we head into Maria La Gorda, the western tip, there's a, the road gets quite rough again. And you know, you'll notice that um, this is why we recommend slightly wider tires on your bike. Um, definitely gives you better shock absorption, more comfortable ride. And here we're just clowning around, hanging on to the back of another horse-drawn cart. Uh, this is uh, just a picture of the Maria La Gorda Resort, uh, which is an international diving center. We finally take the bus back and, and return to Veradero, where we stay again for uh, two nights, again to decompress and pack our bags and prepare for the return home. Um, this is a picture again from Mango 2020 uh, at the beach. And um, uh, I, I just love to kind of juxtapose our first picture when we begin the tour and we're all a bit tense and worried about how it's going to go and how we feel. And by the end of it, we're all suntanned and relaxed and uh, it's just been a great experience. Uh, the final thing we'll do on the Fat Mary tour is go to the Xanadu mansion. This is, uh, was the former DuPont family's estate uh, in Veradero and we'll have dinner there. And then here's just a summary of those uh, two tours, just to go over what to expect. Um, in the 15 days of the bike tour, uh, 10 of them are cycling days. We typically ride between 25 and 100 kilometers, um, but the bus is of course always there. And if uh, the distance is too long, you can always hop on the bus, it's air conditioned and uh, have a snack and a rest and we'll all get together to the destination. Uh, the terrain is generally quiet back roads and uh, there's some city cycling. Uh, there are rolling hills and occasionally they'll be a bit steep, um, but we'll take our time and make our way up them. Um, the road surfaces can be variable. And as I mentioned before, we generally recommend tires of 28 millimeters to say 40 millimeters. So um, that just gives you a more comfortable ride and hybrid bikes or gravel cyclocross and touring bikes um, work best, but, um, but certainly people have ridden road racing bikes and other things as well and succeeded. Uh, the bike rentals are available for a fee. I think the cost of the hybrid bikes is about $15 a day and that's for the days when they're cycling, so $150 total. Um, I've mentioned the, the fully supported aspect and all of the uh, support we get from uh, this, the team that rides with us uh, throughout, throughout the tour. Um, and again, the prices include the accommodation and most meals, um, the bus, the driver, et cetera. The additional fees would be the airfare to get down there. And I was just looking today, the, the current cost to fly from, um, for example, from Toronto to uh, either Holguin or Veradero is in the vicinity of seven to eight hundred dollars, uh, including taxes and fees. And fortunately, most of the airlines, um, given COVID, are providing uh, some versions of, of um, insurance against cancellation. Um, and there again are the, the 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 timelines for the tours and the costs for either single or du double occupancy. And I'll just leave this slide up in terms of um, if you want to get in contact with me, there's my phone number. And let's see, I'll pull up the participants and uh, see if I can, I can unmute all if that's possible. Let's see if it'll let me do that. There, I've asked you to unmute. So, if, so we do have um, at least another 10 minutes. So um, welcome Sean and Warren who joined us just after we began. And yeah, happy to take any questions or any comments. So can you, um, 
I did see your little blurb about the um, uh, <clears throat> requirements for uh, the COVID tests and stuff like that. So at, at our end, can you just review that again? For Cuba, we just need to be double vaccinated, but coming back, we have to have a negative test? Right. So yeah, the Cuban government and the Canadian government have their own their own expectations. So beginning November 15th, um, if you're double vaccinated, um, Cuba's allowing you to arrive um, with proof of vaccination. If you're not double vaccinated, they are allowing people to demonstrate a 72 hour PCR test for arrival in Cuba. Um, a key thing that we were watching was whether or not it would be possible um, to travel around Cuba without a quarantine period. And you know, fortunately for us, there's no quarantine period if you meet those criteria. Uh, coming back to Canada, um, you've got the standard requirement to come into Canada of a 72 hour PCR test um, to present when you arrive in Canada. Uh, the Cuban government is providing the PCR test for $30 US, which is a bargain. It's usually about $200 and uh, that would be sufficient to get you back into Canada. Okay, Did that, thank you. Uh, yeah, your, answer your question? Yeah. yeah, thank you. And just a note for everybody, under the menu at the bottom, reactions, that's raise a hand in case there's too many people talking. But anyway. Oh, fantastic. Is I, I really appreciated uh, watching that, Lee. How many years have you been going down there, aside from leading tours? Um, Gosh, I mean, I probably probably 20 years ago was would have been the first time in Cuba. Um, I've been on tours there in 2010 and 2015 and uh, and led the Guantanamo Mango Tour in 2020. And uh, this year I'm looking forward to doing two tours. So pretty excited about that. I think I saw Warren and Liz eating fruit uh, from the back of their, or the side. That, that's pretty neat. Yeah, yeah, Warren and Elizabeth were both with us uh, in, on the Mango Tour, and uh, so was Sean, who's on the line. And I think Sean's very politely raised his hand, so. Yes, I have. I, I want to I wanna... <laughs> play with that little gadget. Um, um, so how many people are, well, two questions. Um, how many people are you expecting for the size of the group? I know last year we we're a small group of eight. So is that typical or are there expected more people? And also are there deadlines for deposits and stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah. Great questions. Um, yeah. I would sort of consider sort of seven or eight is sort of a minimum. Um, and that's, again, it's not my call. That's Peter's call in terms of, uh, you know, what's financially viable in terms of a group size. So seven or eight is doable. Right now we've got um, between 11 and 12 people penciled in for both of the tours. Um, it'd be great to be more like 14 to 15, but um, as I say, anywhere between seven and 15 is fine. Um, so, so I think we're okay now in terms of numbers and, uh, but it would be ideal to get some more people. So, you know, if you know anyone that's interested, let me know. Um, in terms of timelines, um, Peter is, uh, is, will be seeking um, deposits 90 days before the tour. So that works out to being, um, I just got it written down here, uh, October 8th uh, for Celia and October 28th for Fat Mary for a deposit. Um, the final payments are due, so the full payment is due 60 days prior. Uh, so that's November 8th and 28th. Um, and those deposits, uh, Peter assures me, would be refundable if we had to cancel the tour for any reason. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the flights generally, and it is very complicated, you have to look from airline to airline, but they're generally offering refunds um, if, the if the flight can't happen. But we'll have to pay very close attention uh, to the flights, and it's probably worth getting additional insurance. Yeah, I won't, I won't be this January, February, but I'll look forward for another year. Yeah, no, don't worry. I, um, I always feel like putting a disclaimer on the invitation saying this isn't going to be some high pressure sales job. I'm not going to, 
try to convince you to sign up before the call ends. I just want to share the information and over time people will get the chance to see the opportunity and, and if it works for people from one year to the next, then that's great. Um, one thing that, that we didn't cover and I can just quickly mention um, is health insurance. So um, the Cuban government has uh, traditionally, they've more or less required uh, tourists to get health insurance. And what they've done in the past is, is for $30, they provide you with um, medical health insurance while you're on the island. And uh, this year they're doing the same thing and it's related to COVID. So um, everybody that signs up for the tour will get this $30 Cuban health coverage while you're on the island. Um, personally, I would, you know, I've got my own international travel health insurance as well. And I think we'd recommend having that in addition, but it does demonstrate that while you're in Cuba, uh, you would be able to um, use the Cuban health system uh, with this health insurance that, they, that they're providing at a very minimal cost. What's the vaccination status of Cuba? Ah, another great question. Um, it's, it's, it's actually pretty p positive. I mean, they've had a really bad year. They were closed. They typically Canadian tourists are almost, or I think the largest number of tourists they get. And I, I think they were down like 98% or something in terms of Canadians, but they did have um, a surge of Russian tourists. So there was actually more Russian tourists last season than normal. And unfortunately that brought a lot of COVID to the island and they had a really bad experience. Um, since that time, uh, Cuba went it alone in terms of developing their own uh, COVID vaccine. And um, they are 30, I think it's like 32% through fully vaccinating Cubans with their own vaccine. And they expect to have everyone, um, children and adults both um, fully vaccinated by November. So they've, uh, they're, they're well on track to have a fully vaccinated population. They went to the World Health Organization um, about two weeks ago to have their, their vaccines internationally recognized. I've got a, quite a number of friends that live on farms in the area and uh, some of them are fully vaccinated, but all of them have had at least one shot and that's in you know, a low risk rural area. So, so it's coming along quite well. Certainly optimistic for them. Sean, did you raise your hand again? Yes, I did. I love you. <laughs> Sean, Sean, uh, Sean and Warren were, were both on the Mango Tour. I might have mentioned that already. So great to see you both again. Um, so my question actually is, uh, I saw a note at the beginning of today's presentation uh, uh, that it's going to be recorded. So just, for example, if I do have... Uh, a friend or something that I want to pass this on to, then do I um, get in touch with you and you send it to me as a link or an, an attachment or like, how does that work so I can send it on to other people? Is that, is that the technological advantage of uh, the recording? Exactly. So um, what, I, what I'll do is, is post it on my, I've got a YouTube uh, channel. Um, and feel free to go there if you want to see some excellent videos of uh, touring in Cuba, uh, including our mango mm -hmm. tour. But um, I will also post a link to the um, or post the video on there and you can just share that link. OK, well, we're this that actually just quite nicely fit at 39 minutes. So I'd say, um, you know, if there's no further questions, we can. Uh, we can end the presentation. I just want to thank you all for, for joining and taking time out of your day to join us today. Um, and again, you, you've got my email. Um, you know, shoot me a message anytime if you have any questions or if you want any more information. So thanks very much. Have a great day.